It's the game that counts. A question of sport follows Carol Vorderman now on BBC One. More real life mysteries. On tonight's programme, an accident leaves a boy critically ill. Did his twin brother know about it in advance? A mysterious explosion in the Australian outback. And can a brush with death reveal the future? Although there seems to be a bond between brothers and sisters, when you look at twins, especially identical twins, there often seems to be something that goes far deeper. Our first film is about this mysterious connection between identical twin brothers. Me and my twin brother Alex, um, born in 64, um, we were brought up as a unit really. Well, we weren't brought up deliberately like that, but we always spent all our time together, we always played together, all our conversations were together. You know, it was difficult to do anything without him. He was part of me, he was my, he was my other half because of that mental connection that we had. It's almost like a, like a sixth sense. I first met them in 1970 and they were so close, they were just Marks and Alley. And you said it almost as one, you know, it was almost like one name. Um, because you didn't expect to see them apart, and you never did. I mean, I can't think of the twins without each other, ever. Being a twin, you just don't think that it's very odd. It's only when you get older that you start to realise it's actually quite, something quite special. When we were 18, Alex got a job in a hotel as a trainee chef, which meant that he actually lived there. And I was doing a cabinet making course and I had stayed at home. And that was quite strange because that was the first time that we had actually separated. I woke up one night, sort of two in the morning, feeling very, very agitated. And it was a feeling about Alex, which was very, very strong. He was very much in my mind as an image and that image was extremely negative. And I couldn't understand why or what it was, but the more I thought about it, the worse the feeling got. It just kept getting stronger and stronger. I knew that there was some reason that I was feeling like this, and that had to be bad, and that meant that something had happened to him. Mum? Mum? What? What's the matter? Something's wrong with Alex. As far as she was concerned, I was just talking gibberish and I'd obviously had a nightmare. I go back to bed. She couldn't really understand why I was coming to wake her up. Because I was 18 years old, it's not something you do at that age, go and wake your mother up in the middle of the night because you've got a nightmare. Yes, this is Mrs. Lewis. An accident? Which way to the street? Oh my God. What, what, what happened? Hold straight. No, no, I'll be there as soon as I can. Thank you. Bye bye. The minute the phone actually rang is when I knew that I was right. I wasn't going mad. Alex had been involved in a motorbike crash. He was now unconscious with a serious head injury. The crash had happened at the same time as Marcus's premonition. Of course, I, I don't know what Marcus was experiencing when he woke up with those very strong feelings, but all I can say is that uh, I have met a number of twins who have had feelings of great distress, which later has found to be time-related to when their twin has had an accident or has even died. Uh, I can only think that in some way it's related to the fact that they do carry the same genes, that they have shared a womb together, and so there is something very special in the bond that identical twins have. And uh, perhaps one day we'll understand it, but I don't think we do at the moment. Several days after the accident, Alex still hadn't regained consciousness. The doctors were becoming increasingly worried about his chances of making a full recovery, as he'd already fractured his skull as a baby. 
Given this degree of severity of injury, the likelihood is that he would have had damage throughout his brain and therefore a profound effect on his level of consciousness and on his thought processes, his, his reasoning, his awareness and so forth. It was a really difficult time. Their mother was in the hospital with Marcus almost the whole time. Marcus didn't want to leave his brother. Then there was worry that he might be um, brain damaged because he was unconscious for a very long time. And my terrible worry is how on earth would Marcus survive if anything happened to his brother? I used to go and see him every day and they were telling us that there was a very strong possibility that he would have brain damage when he woke up. But I knew that he was going to be fine when he woke up because I was going to be there. It's going to be all right, Alex. I would just sort of sit there and talk to him and chat to him. Footy on the weekend? And wait for him to wake up. I saw Dean yesterday. Because we knew that he was going to wake up, that was the one positive thing. But it was a question of when. I'm running the embassy today as well. Better get those visas in if we're still going to go to Australia next month. Alex? Alex? Hello, Marky. He opened his eyes and he said, hello, Marky, which is my nickname. And my relief was immense because I knew that he, he was going to be all right. Who's this woman? It's Marcus. Who's this woman? Darling, it's Mummy. Get her away from me. Get her away, Marcus. Didn't know who my mother was, but he knew who I was. And it turned out later that he'd actually lost his memory. And basically, he knew one fact, and that was who I was. And other than that, he didn't know his name, he didn't know our mother, he didn't know our father, he didn't know any of our friends. And he had to start his whole life afresh from that, from that day. I woke up not knowing my own name or who I was, yet looking at somebody else and knowing that that was my brother and that was his name and that was a fact, a single fact, yet still not knowing who I was at that point or anyone else around me or my own mother standing by my bed. That to me is extraordinary. It seems beyond, beyond medicine. I mean, it just seems beyond what is possible, but that's how it happened. If somebody else told me this story, I would probably say, oh, go on, you're exaggerating a bit. But it's true. It's not exaggerated. That is how it was. It's twins who, who've lived their lives, you know, so closely wound up that they are able to know e each other in a way that the rest of us can't. The explanations are for someone else to give. The image of his twin and the sound of his twin's voice was the series of stimuli to which he was most frequently exposed during the time when he was recovering from his head injury. And I think it's therefore highly likely that that is why he made that initial response. Uh, one can explain the rejection of the rest of the family, not as memory loss, but as confusion. And this would be entirely uh, reasonable, given the severity of his head injury. Although the twins had always been close, the death of their mother and Alex's continued memory loss brought them even closer. They now run a successful business together. Hi, Marcus. Hi, Marcus. If Mick goes up to our yeah, he's going to do that. I'll go to that what Marcus did for me in those early days was fill in the gaps, quite simply. He said, this is where you live, this is your mother, this is your father, this is your girlfriend, this is your job, this is your car, everything. And I always say to people, you know, oh yeah, I remember doing this, I remember doing that. It's just from what I remember of Marcus telling me we did. So I basically got his memories in my mind of what we did, and he's now given to me. That's probably made us closer still, actually. And that's made it? us closer still, yes. And there's no arguing over that. So no one in charge. And I to... did resist the fact of telling you things that weren't quite true to make myself look better. <laughs> Never did that. I always told you straight up. Honest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Despite constantly being told that we live in an age of freedom of information, there are still occasions when governments act without our knowledge, often in the name of national security, such as tests on new weapon technology like planes, tanks or even missiles. 
Our next mystery concerns a strange explosion in a remote area of the Australian outback, which led one man on a two-year search for the truth. His search took him around the globe, from Washington to Tokyo and Australia. In 1993, the calm of the Australian outback was shattered by an explosion which registered 3.7 on the Richter scale. Geologist Harry Mason had been working in the region for nearly 30 years. He decided to investigate. I began to research this, but I had no idea where this was going to go. I mean, I was researching a fireball explosion, an earthquake, which we thought was a meteorite impact. This has taken me right around the world. It's gone into a, a whole new universe of weapon systems and, and skullduggery and espionage. And uh, I'm afraid the data is tending more and more towards these horrific new weapons of war, which unfortunately most people on the planet don't know exist. And I think it's high time people did know they exist. So what had happened? Earthquakes are non-existent in this part of the gold fields. It hasn't had any in Aboriginal memory or in seismic recorder memory since 1900. So got pretty excited about this. This was going to be a fantastic thing to research. I decided that what was necessary was to get out there in the field to hunt down any eyewitnesses. And we're talking a very large area, so that was not easy. Um, but I finally got lucky and located a number of Aboriginal witnesses who had um, seen this whole thing from start to finish. All right, that one. What he saw was a saw of a light coming from the west, straight over the top of us. It's a whistling noise, was it? Just a big bang and lit everything up. Most of them all thought it was the end of the world. What's going on? We heard a bang. And the earth sort of shook. We had eyewitness reports of a fireball flying through the sky. It was a huge flash of light and a massive earth tremor. Now, it seemed pretty reasonable that a very large chunk of rock had flown in from space and impacted on the ground, and that this had caused the earthquake. And that was the end of the story. From combining all the evidence, Harry pinpointed the location of the explosion to a remote sheep station where he found another witness. One night I was laying in bed, and the next minute this thing started coming over from the south, and it's with the ground and made a bang and it's leave the light right up in the sky and stay there for hours. Now the clincher really is Kelman's evidence for when this thing ended. Um, it turned off as if someone threw a light switch. One moment it was there, the next moment it wasn't. And you're starting to really wonder, um, this is one hell of a strange kind of meteorite if it was a meteorite at all. Um, one way of solving this argument was to actually go out there and find an impact crater. We calculated there should have been a crater of the order of about 100 metres in diameter and we should have had a significant blast damage area and we couldn't find it. The area Harry was looking into was Banjawan Station. This remote sheep station had belonged to the Yom Shinrikyo, a Japanese religious cult held responsible for the terrorist nerve gas attack in the Tokyo subway in 1995, which killed 12 people and injured thousands. Banjawan Station had been purchased by the Japanese Aum cult. Um, then I heard how the Aum had attempted to purchase nuclear weapons from the Russians and were thought to have attempted to make, to make their own. Well, we started to put all this together and we didn't like what we were seeing. In fact, we seriously began to wonder if they hadn't detonated a small nuclear device somewhere on Banjawan Station. Unproven, but sufficient evidence to suggest someone better have a look at this quick, because maybe that's what we're dealing with. Is that the US Senate? There's sort of a hushed silence at the other end. I knew I'd hit something. It was like, oh Christ, please send everything you've got right now. The US Senate have been investigating the OMS activities ever since the Tokyo subway attack. What we know about the OM indicates that they could, if they put their mind to it and their efforts to it, could develop weapons of mass destruction. The significance of the 
Tokyo gas attack was that this was no longer a hypothetical threat. The Aum Shinrikyo was the first group that used chemical weapons on an innocent civilian population. The genie was finally out of the bottle. They killed people, and they were trying to kill hundreds of thousands of people. In October 95, we were contacted by an individual who brought to our attention the fact that there was a mysterious explosion that occurred at or near where the Ohm had operated. Normally, our, my reaction to an incident like this would have been deep skepticism, but because the Ohm did things that a year or two before I would have thought was total fiction, uh, uh, I had to take it seriously. The Senate hired top seismologists to investigate Harry's report. We were able to determine that it wasn't a nuclear weapons test based on the signature, the characteristics of the seismic signal. And the signature seemed to be more similar to that of an earthquake rather than that of an explosion. The problem with that is we don't normally associate earthquakes with objects flying through the sky, loud noises and bright flashes of light that light up the night. After analyzing the satellite images, well, we haven't found any smoking gun. There's no obvious crater there with a smoldering meteorite. And so if the eyewitness accounts are credible, and it's not a meteorite impact, and it's not an earthquake, then what is it? The Ohm uh, were interested in some very strange and bizarre weaponry, some of which was science fiction. Uh, but with the Ohm, the difficulty was that science fiction and reality were, were very much mixed. And that made them so interesting and also so scary. The Senate had discovered that the Ohm were interested in the work of a scientific pioneer called Tesla. T Tesla, you say? Right. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, instant red flag went up here because as it happens I'm a bit of a Tesla buff I have a lot of Tesla's books and books about Tesla and I remember th that somewhere in there there was some data about creating earthquakes Tesla had developed a theory although not proven of uh, making earthquake uh, machines or weapons that would cause earthquakes through alternating waves and currents what he's saying is I can flick a switch and I can create an explosion anywhere on the other side of the planet which you can't defend against and that explosion is of the same order of magnitude as a nuclear blast. Could this have been an intentionally manufactured earthquake? Um, I don't know of any way of remotely triggering earthquakes. There is certainly no credible scientific or, or geophysical mechanism for remotely generating earthquakes. At this point, a scenario like that would still be science fiction. Two years after he started his investigation, Harry still feels he hasn't found the answer. I'm quite prepared to be wrong. Um, let's, let's look at the various scenarios that may be involved here. Meteorite impact problem, no crater. Earthquake, fine, but there's a problem. How do we explain the moving fireball and the huge explosion? I'm the only person who's actually taken the trouble to go out to Banjuan, interview the witnesses and gather the evidence. And I am convinced that there's something far more sinister has happened out there and is happening in the Australian outback. These are the only traces left of the Ohm's occupation of Banjuan Station. Their leaders are now on trial, but in spite of this, John Sopko believes that the mysterious events in Australia might signal the nature of terrorism of the future. The Ohm Shinrikyo itself is no longer a threat. Uh, the Japanese authorities have effectively eliminated that threat by arresting hundreds of individuals, seizing their assets, and putting on trial all of their major uh, uh, leaders. Uh, what still is a threat is an Ohm-like group that could be anywhere. It could be in England, it could be in Australia, it could be in the United States. And it may not be led by a semi-blind Buddhist uh, acupuncturist. Uh, it could be anyone who could do it. Because now weapons of mass destruction can be made by an individual in their bathtub and can be used. And so the motive of individuals and the, uh, uh, the potential for their use is out there.
near-death experiences, tales of going down a tunnel, seeing a white light and then coming back to life are becoming increasingly common. They're happening more and more as medical advances bring patients back from the brink of death. But it's now being suggested that there might be a second part to the story, a longer-term consequence. Many people are claiming that a near-death experience is leaving them with inexplicable powers they've never had before. Julian Rowe and Geoffrey Knapp met last year on a trek to Nepal. They were on a five-day climb which started well, but when they were almost at the top, Geoffrey got hypothermia. I was aware of seeing things that I have done. It's like nothing I've ever experienced. I was not conscious to this world. He spent 16 hours drifting in and out of consciousness. He believes he had a near-death experience. I felt no pain, nothing, but I was watching them from above me. It was wonderfully, wonderfully holy. When Jeffrey regained consciousness, he claimed to have spoken to Julian's dead father, who told him that Julian had always wanted something to remember him by. There happened to be a, a brown pair of shoes. And I was taken aback because my mother had moved in 1990 and had asked if we wanted anything from the house. And there was only one thing I wanted, which was a brown pair of shoes. And I knew right away that, that he had definitely come in contact with my father. Dr. Susan Blackmore has been looking into near-death experiences for 25 years and is skeptical about claims like this. Jeff's story is very interesting, but it reminds me so much of all the stories of mediums and psychics throughout the ages. What typically happens is if you take someone who's been to such a medium or a channeler and say what happened, they'll tell you a wonderful story of, well, the medium told me this fact and that fact and was right about this, that and the other. If you tape record it and go back and listen to the tape recording, what you typically find is that the medium gave hundreds of facts, that many of them were wrong, the very few right ones were remembered, and even then they were often distorted in the person's memory to be even more impressive than in fact they were. And the whole thing really falls apart. Since his experience, Jeffrey has become a psychic healer. He started treating a woman who'd been told she wouldn't be able to have any more children. I had a pretty severe ovarian disease that had progressed over the years um, and at the same time desperately wanted to have more children. We were told, my husband and I were told by three specialists in the field that I certainly would not have more children. I did tell the mother that she would conceive and when she would conceive. But if she had hit, had the hysterectomy as recommended, she would then void all chances of becoming pregnant. I waited two weeks and um, went to have my pre-op lab work done for my hysterectomy and found out that I was pregnant. So they canceled the surgery, obviously. And if it weren't for Jeff telling me to wait, my infection had cleared up, I would have already had had the surgery and would have never had a chance to have children again. I was out of town on business and she called and yelled on the answering machine, you knew it all the time. The fact that against the odds and at such a crucial point, Debbie discovered she was pregnant may well have been a coincidence. No one can ever be sure. But what's certain is that the number of people claiming to be psychic after a near-death experience is increasing. And some say their psychic powers not only give them an insight into personal dilemmas, but also allow them to foresee global disasters. Tom Sawyer has vivid memories of the day in 1978 when he was crushed by a truck. His heart wasn't beating when he arrived at hospital, during which time he says he had a near-death experience. I experienced uh, as though I had a feeling of totally waking up into a state of absolute darkness. It wasn't anything sinister or, or fretful or fearful at, at all. It felt rather usual and comfortable. That darkness seemed to take the shape of a tunnel straight before me. Tom says that as a result, he would know who was on the phone or what people were going to say before they said it. He even believes he predicted a disaster. I was talking with Carol Chesbro on the telephone and I simply interrupted and told her, Carol, uh, there are bridges falling. I have to go and help people in California. 
And what I meant that by that was I can't continue to talk to her on the phone. I have to be still and be alone uh, for that uh, telepathic rapport. I didn't even question him because I knew that this was something that needed his immediate attention. And, and so we hung up and I told my husband and we went over to the television set and turned it on and, and there was nothing, you know. So we thought, well, maybe he doesn't, he's not quite right on this time. And we got talking about other things and then uh, they broke in with a special report that there had been an earthquake. It was the second biggest earthquake in America's history, killing 260 people. This claim of Tom's is very interesting. There have been many interesting experiments which lead me to doubt this kind of precognition. For example, in 1979, an American called Richard Newton predicted that a plane would crash on the 15th of March in the Northern Hemisphere near a center of large population, that there would be red in the logo and 45 people would be killed. Well, two days later than he said, a plane crashed in Qatar, 43 people were killed, there was red in the logo, and it was near the big city. Well, how did he do it? It wasn't precognition. He looked up the statistics. Most planes crash on landing and takeoff, so obviously they're near airports, which are near big cities. Most planes fly in the Northern Hemisphere. The most dangerous month in the year is March, and the second week of March, the Ides of March, <laughs> is the most dangerous of all, and the average number of people killed in plane crashes at that time was 45. He got it right. But the $64,000 question is, if these people can predict the future, why haven't they predicted their way to a fortune? I have awareness that, you know, I could in fact make a lot of money doing this, but it would be immoral spiritually speaking for me. Unfortunately, I think we have in this culture and in many other cultures too, a kind of association between uh, being psychic and being spiritual. Now it seems to me that true spirituality has absolutely nothing to do with levitating objects and, and, and precognizing the future. Nevertheless, those things are linked in people's minds. So somehow, you know, if you can be psychic, that sort of proves that you are good, spiritual and so on. And I think that's one of the reasons why people want to be psychic. Uh, there are others. I mean, they may want to control people. They may want to exploit people. They may want to make money out of people. Those, I would say, are less common. Than, than simply a desire to, uh, to feel that you're special. That's it for this week. On our next programme... Fire! Get out! Now! Michelle. A family's terrifying ordeal when their daughter is trapped in a burning house and the mystery surrounding her escape. It does tend to make you go... Pardon? And how did this woman beat cancer without any treatment? Until then, from Mysteries, goodbye. Next on BBC One, Tim Henman versus Steve Redgrave, a question of sport. And on BBC Two in a moment, Christmas food and drink.